So um, this talk is all about why I love and why I don't love defensive work and other random stories. I figured I would probably talk for 40-ish minutes, plus minus, a um, bunch of times for uh, questions, and I'll stick around for a bit after as well. So um, who am I? So um, I'm originally from Oslo. I studied in Trondheim. I moved out um, first to London in 2010, um, and then to the US in 2012, and um, I now live in New York City. I am very passionate about journalism security, and I'll talk a bit later about exactly how I define that space. Uh, previously worked for the Tor Project, Freedom of the Press Foundation, and the New York Times. And now for the past two plus years, uh, I've been doing primarily freelance work. Um, I'm an advisor to Ford Foundation in the US, which is a um, big, big, big funder of NGOs and smaller nonprofits, uh, both in the US and elsewhere. I am also an advisor on a subcommittee of CISA, the Cyber Security Infrastructure Security Agency within uh, the US uh, government. Um, and I also run journalists and spy on Instagram, which is this like project that in each post profiles a journalist who was also a spy, or a spy who used uh, journalism as a cover, which I think is pretty cool. So check that out. And um, I have a very cute cat, Pumpkin. OK, so um, why this talk? Uh, well, I agreed to keynote on March 31st, which means I had about two months to come up with a topic, um, which should be fairly straightforward, right? It's not. Um, it's plenty of time to come up with something. Um, but you know, what do you talk about when you've been just sitting at home for two plus years? I can, I can tell you that I baked all of two banana breads. I built a bunch of mechanical keyboards. I watched a lot of Netflix. So in trying to figure out exactly what to, what to say for like 40 plus minutes on, on stage, um, I took a lot of inspiration from Holvar's keynote at Offensive Con 2020, where he talked about um, why he loves and does not love offensive work. So if you're interested in sort of the flip side to this, definitely go and check that out on YouTube. Um, also figured that um, my take on Defensive work plus a bunch of random stories maybe my sort of kind of non-standard path to what I do today can inspire and help someone else here. So this is me trying to condense basically a bunch of guidance, stories, and hot takes into a single talk. OK, so I was trying to figure out like how I would bucket out reasons to love defensive work. There's the technical reasons. There's the economic reasons, there's the emotional reasons. So within the tech space, um, defensive work can really be full stack. Like you can work with hardware, firmware, software, logic. You can work with um, how humans interact with the technology. Um, there's like always a new puzzle, like a new creative challenge, which is sort of what I really found initially um, way back in the day. So, I got a computer first when I was 15, and very quickly, um, very quickly found that I really like learning how to do things that I'm not supposed to do, and sort of kind of not crossing that, that line, but sometimes maybe sort of, uh, but not breaking any rules. Um, and so I always like really, really loved like that puzzle and that creative challenge and just the amount of different things that you can learn. Economic, I'll get back to that a bit later, but bottom line is that everybody needs good security, and for emotional reasons, everybody deserves good security, and I'll talk about the difference um, later on. And of course, it's a, facet, it's a really, really good opportunity to do really good work with good people for good reasons, which I really enjoy. So way back in the day, 2009, that was... Um, before I started my, the last year of my bachelor's, um, I needed a summer job. I, was, um, I had heard about Google Summer of Code, which is effectively Google giving nonprofit organizations funding to take on summer interns. 
Um, it's still around. You should check it out. Um, so I was like browsing the Google Summer of Code website, thinking like, surely there is something here that I can apply for. I found this thing called Tor, and I just initially thought it was like really, really cool that here's a tool that allows you to be anonymous online. Um, and that was it. I, I didn't really think about, is that someone's phone? Okay. <laughs> At least it's not me. Maybe it's NSO. Um, so I found Tor and just thought it was like really cool that like there's this thing that allows you to be anonymous online. I didn't consider anything like beyond those lines of code. I didn't consider the uh, connectedness of this tool and the libraries and how it ties into browsers and the amount of forensic research you can do around it. I didn't consider like UI UX and design or the documentation. Like I didn't think about really anything else. I didn't consider how people actually use it or to what extent people can benefit from it. So I spent that summer working for Tor and then ended up um, volunteering for about a year. Then Tor offered me a part-time contract and then later on a full-time contract. And I think in total, I spent about four years with Tor. And so over those four years, I really got to do a lot of different things. And I think that was the benefit of working for like a, either like a startup or like a small um, nonprofit is that you do, it's, it's sort of like an all hands on deck. You really do get to try out a bunch of different roles. So I got to do both um, development and QA, documentation, training, project management. I got to do a lot of um, training for reporters as well. I got to do research into online safety and censorship circumvention. Um, like during the Arab Spring, a lot of people found Tor and figured out how to then use that tool to get access to censored sites. Um, the governments in the different countries um, found different ways to then try and block Tor. So we did some research to try and figure out, well, how do we get around this? Um, and it really wasn't until I found Tor that I really got to understand just um, how important that tool is for people elsewhere and just what it means to them and what it enables them to do. And so in, I think it was in 2011, Tor got funding from, if I remember correctly, the US Department of State to train reporters. And I ended up leading that project and the, the goal was really to teach reporters how to use Tor to be safe online. But we also found very quickly that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to teach someone how to use Tor if they're not already familiar with passwords, two-factor software updates, all of those other good stuff. Um, and so we built like a curriculum around it, um, which is sort of how I then shaped that um, into my de definition of uh, journalism security. And so that's like how I got onto this like track of working specifically within that space. Because after tour, I ended up working for um, Freedom of the Press Foundation for a bit, doing sort of kind of the same work. I then took that to the New York Times and worked there as the director of information security for the newsroom, um, reporting into the CISO on the business side of the company, but uh, physically sitting in the newsroom with the reporters and focusing on uh, the things that, that they needed. And I'm sure I'll get back to that a bit later on. So journalism security, um, if I were to like try and explain exactly what that is, I would say that it's about securing an identity and the business which enables the work. So. Being a reporter is more than an, a nine to five job. It's more like an identity. You are a reporter if you're um, sitting on the couch on a Friday evening and browsing Twitter on your personal phone. You're a reporter when you're traveling to Berlin or to New York. You're a reporter when you're like physically in the office nine to five. And so securing that means that you do need to account for not just the corporate systems and accounts, you do also need to consider um, 
their physical safety, their emotional safety, um, any sort of legal challenges associated with their work, um, and also their online accounts, and, and that does extend to personal online accounts as well, like so social media, for example. Um, and so that is a much, much bigger space than I think what um, most corporations view, because typically it's the, the business will secure the corporate stuff, but then who's responsible for the personal stuff, right? And, and that's sort of where, um, where this space exists. So within the business that enables the work, I put it into sort of three buckets. So you got the newsroom with your reporters and their sources, their communications, whether that's on a work device or a personal one. Um, you got any sort of notes, drafts, stories, the places that they travel to. All of those pieces, all of those challenges exist in the newsroom and someone needs to think about how do you actually go about securing that type of work. Then on the business side of the company, you got your sort of typical like, you got finance, legal, HR, M&A, infrastructure, engineering, and so on. It's effectively all of the groups that just enable the newsroom to do what it's doing. So you got the engineering and infrastructure teams that are maybe hosting email, but that's not super common these days, but definitely um, developing, maintaining the CMS, for example. So that is something that they are doing for the benefit of the newsroom so that they can write and draft and publish stories. And then finally, third bucket, we've got subscribers, which is really where we're dealing with other people's info and other people's money. That's, again, something that needs to uh, exist, and you also need to secure. That is something that's primarily sitting on the business side of the company. It's the teams on the business side of the company who are responsible for securing the subscribers, but ultimately it is the subscribers' money that is funding the work that the newsroom is doing. And so when I say that I work on journalism security stuff, a good portion of that exists within the newsroom bucket. I do work a lot um, directly with reporters on someone is traveling, someone's communicating with a source, someone needs help digging into something else. Um, there's a bit more interaction over the years now with the business side as well. So these days when I give a training to reporters on how to be safe online, I do also ask that at least one person from the business side, like from IT, attend the training so that any advice that I give to the reporters, they do have an IT person there who knows what I said, who understands all of it, and who can then actually follow up and support the people when I am no longer there. And I think that that is one way to sort of scale it up a bit. Um, and subscribers, I'll, I'll get back to that um, a bit later on, because not a whole lot is done, uh, done there these days. So here's some like other fun examples um, with sort of just the, the type of work that would exist in this space. So um, newsrooms are also very like fast paced and deadline driven and reporters are notoriously impatient, I will say. Um, so I have, I've had more than like one case of like a reporter that like just walks into uh, back when I had an office or, or stops by my desk and says, oh, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, I'm going to North Korea next week, what do I do? Um, so you have like a week and a half to try to figure out like what are they doing there, who are they going with, how long for, where are they staying, they probably do need a travel laptop, but can they get away with a Chromebook or do they need something different? Um, what exactly is the purpose of the trip? What about physical security? Are they entering the country on a journalist visa or not? Trying to like ask all of those questions on top of your regular nine to five job. Um, then there's a sort of question of how do you secure an office in pick a country? So the New York Times has, uh, or at least had, bureaus in like Moscow, Beijing, Shanghai, um, in a lot of really, really interesting places. And so then the question is, how do you then safely, for one, get people in and out of those places, but how do you also support a physical office with computers and infrastructure and connection back to HQ when they're in these locations? 
which again, primarily a business side challenge because that's where you have your IT and support and, and all of those teams. And then we sort of like touch on the, the personal side, like how do you recover a compromised Twitter account? Now, of the types of um, security issues that, that I saw a lot of in the newsroom, it was primarily like my social media whatever got hacked. And what is interesting at that point is that like if, if the Twitter account for a well-known reporter at the New York Times is hacked, there's the not only does the um, actor then have the ability to, to tweet and delete and follow and follow, retweet, but also read DMs. And a lot of reporters will use DMs to interact with sources or like any sort of interview sub subject. So there's a lot of like sensitive um, data in there that would have a reputational impact, not just on the reporter, but also on their employer. But Twitter then considers this a personal account. So if I reach out to Twitter on behalf of the reporter and say, hey, so-and-so's account got hacked, like, what do we do? Um, the answer, at least a few years ago, would just be, oh, well, you just have to have them like file a support ticket, and then we'll get back to you. So interacting with the social media companies over the years has, um, it's, it's improved a lot now. I, th I think that Facebook and Twitter and also at Google do have um, a process for security teams at MediaWorks to try and escalate and get the assistance that they need so that they do um, see that a, a personal Twitter account, if it belongs to a reporter, is, is both a personal and a... Um, corporate type of account. But that's another like fun uh, corporate political type of challenge. Then there were also some like questions around like, well, do we worry about using G Suite? So um, the New York Times got hacked by China back in 2012. Um, and I think the actor was in the system for like four months. There's a really, really good long um, art article about it from Nicole Perlroth. And um, back then, the New York Times ran its own email system. A couple of years after that, it switched to G Suite. But if you're a big media organization doing investigative reporting and you're reporting on Google, should you be using Google for email? Should you be using Google for your notes, for your drafts, for your photos, for all of your future plans? Same with Slack. So those are sort of other questions that sort of came up, and we tried to figure out, like, to what extent is this actually a concern for us? Um, how paranoid should we be? And then that, like, final question is, like, how do you protect subscribers from credential stuffing? Um, which has been, I know, a few media orgs in um, Norway has struggled with over the years, where someone's just found um, password dumps online and decided to try out all the usernames and passwords of Norwegian sounding names on uh, various sites in Norway. And that then goes into this like big question of like, who's responsible for, uh, for securing subscribers? I don't know how many uh, media orgs today offer two factor for subscribers, but that should definitely be a thing. The bottom line is you can, you can only do so much, right, within like a nine to five day. And before I went into the times, I definitely had this like view of like securing a reporter should look like this. If they're traveling to North Korea, it should look like this. But then you get there and it's just like incredibly like fast paced. You don't necessarily have all the resources you thought you would have. The reporter is certainly not going to be patient enough to use whatever setup you had concocted in your mind. They may not even want to use a Chromebook. So like you sort of cobble together the best possible thing that you can, and you just sort of figure it out and you make it work, um, which is part of what I, what I really, really love about this type of work is that there are so many like curveballs and challenges and like ad hoc solutions that to some extent you just sort of kind of wing it. Okay, gun hacking, which was pretty fun, um, because why not? Um, so I've always been really interested in like stereotypical American things. So back in 2014, 
uh, my, my husband told me, and we lived in DC at the time, he's like, well, you've, you've never been to a gun show in the US. Uh, and so he decided that, that we should go. So we did, and while there, I, I ran into a booth from a company called Tracking Point. And they had, for one, they had this like uh, video demo, they had the rifle there, they had like a brochure telling us all about it, talking about how it like has um, Wi-Fi and mobile apps and USB ports and it does software updates, and it was like, well, that sounds sounds interesting. So, like in the in the car on the way home, uh, I I just casually asked my husband, like, hey, we should we should uh, buy one and hack it and present at Black Hat and DEF CON next year. That was always a bucket list item of mine. And he's like, sure, why not? So we we uh, I'll, I'll I'll say that the rifle was thirteen thousand um, dollars, and and we bought two because we <laughs> had to. <laughs> Because we had to take one apart, uh, and then we weren't sure if it was going to actually work after. So we, so we bought two. We took a Boleto loan. We bought two. Um, and it was really a co combination of hardware and software, where my husband had more experience with the hardware side of things. I do more of the software side. And then um, a good amount of it was like, I don't know what this thing does, but let's push the button and see. Um, and so. Um, I also did reach out to some folks at the Electronic Frontier Foundation just to get some legal advice around what it is that we were doing, making sure that no one was going to sue us at the end of it. Um, but I think I have a photo on the next slide. So here's, here's what it looks like. Um, so it's a standard um, Remington rifle, and then Tracking Point had added the scope with the computer and also the red button by the trigger. So the red button allows you to tag your target, meaning once you've tagged the target, the trigger is not going to release unless that little computer has figured out that if the trigger is released at this point in time, you are going to hit your target. So it's like sniping for dummies. Like This was the first time I actually fired any, any weapon, and I hit my target 100% of the time. Um, what could possibly go wrong? So uh, we had this like sitting on our kitchen counter for about eight months with like cable coming out of it and um, computers and batteries and, and stuff like that. Um, let's see if I have something on the next slide. Nope. Okay. So what we were able to find uh, was I'll, I'll say first we cannot fire remotely. That was like the one good thing about this project. Um, what we could do is we can lock the trigger so you cannot fire at all. We found a way to create custom software updates, because uh, the company had um, not properly done um, signature checking on their GPG encrypted uh, software update. So once you had access to the file system on this device, you could effectively just reconstruct a software update for any other tracking point rifle. So we just made our own. Um, we also found that one of the mobile apps allowed you to, to sort of plug in values for um, wind and temperature and the type of bullet that you were using. And so we could then, by bypassing the app, tell that computer that the bullet was heavier than it really was, which means that when it tries to calculate when to release the trigger, um, it has the wrong numbers to start off with, and we can cause you to like misfire two and a half feet to the left or to the right. So you will just miss your target every single time. Um, and the company, like on the day that we presented at Black Hat and, uh, yeah, Black Hat in 2015, uh, the company issued this like official statement on their website that read, it is safe to continue using the Wi-Fi on your rifle as long as you're sure there are no hackers within 100 feet. <laughs> And I think that they've since gone out of business. So, so economic reasons to love this work. Well, everybody needs good security, and bad people continue to do bad things, which leads to fancy headlines, bigger budgets. Uh, I'm sure there's like a pie chart or like stats for this, but I didn't didn't bother finding any. Um, which also means that we will never, ever, ever be out of a job, which is pretty cool. Um, 
there's a lot of opportunity in this space. There's a lot of opportunity to create something new. I mean, the type of work that I do, there's not, it's not like there's a company that does it. And it's not like there's a predefined role for it. But I do somehow make it work. So it's entirely possible to go out and create a role for yourself that isn't the sort of standard nine to five, typical whatever IT security related job. So if there's something that you're really, really passionate about, it's entirely possible to do it. And uh, last point, you should be paid for your work, even presentations. I'll just say that I'm not getting paid for this one. I did get paid for the one I gave yesterday. I included that um, bullet item because a few years ago, um, when was this? Eight years ago, maybe? I was at a conference in Stockholm and I realized that I was the only speaker not getting paid and not flying business simply because I did not ask for it. And I <coughs> talked to a friend of mine a couple of weeks ago about the sort of talks that I'm giving in the, in the next few months, and he said, oh, wait, you're getting paid? I'm like, yeah, you should be paid for your work even if that is giving a talk. So remember this for the future. Emotional reasons to love what I do. Well, everybody deserves good security. And there's a big difference there between everybody needs it in the corporate sense, in the what is it that we are legally required to do, and more the emotional, everybody deserves it, what goes then beyond what is legally required, what is the right thing to do. And that discussion is always a fun one to have with uh, legal teams at companies. Of course, bad people continue to do bad things. Um, I have a very personal desire to have impact. I get a lot of value out of having impact with the work that I do. Um, the high after success, I mean, I have to say, it, it does feel really good to like walk home after a long day at the New York Times knowing that I got to help with this article that's gonna be the, on the front page of the paper the next day. So no one else really knows about it yet, but I know that I had an impact there. And so personally, I draw a lot of value from that. I think that um, there will be a sort of a point in time when, uh, when I am looking to do more than what I am doing today because I know that there's so many people that need the type of support that I can provide. Um, and so I'm like always like chasing ways that I can have impact and do good work. And I also love meeting a lot of different people. There's a lot of cool people in, in this space. There's a growing community of people. There's more diversity now than uh, before, all of which I think is pretty amazing. Okay. Why I don't love defensive work. I'll try not to be too sad and salty about it. But, okay. So, Technical, as we, as we talked about, there's a lot of stuff to play with, there's a lot of stuff to secure, it's basically securing all the things all the time, which is a lot. Um, everybody needs good security, but not everybody will invest in it. Um, everybody deserves good security, but corporate politics gets in the way, and you get to do good work with good people for good reasons until you burn out. That may or may not sound familiar to some of you. So back in the day when I was, um, before I started full time with Tor, I did pen testing for a small company in London. And initially I thought that was really cool. Um, got to learn a lot, got to see some interesting clients. Uh, banks in London have really amazing food. Uh, but I did find that the work was very, very repetitive. Um, over time, I would go to the same clients to test the same type of app written by the same development team with the same issues, giving the same report, and going back for a retest a few months later and still finding the same issues. So over time, I just like, for me, I just didn't find any, any joy in that. I didn't find that I was like actually making a difference. I didn't feel like the work I was doing had any impact. There's also a huge attack surface um, out there. So like working with a reporter 
who comes to you and asks, like, you know, what do I do about NSO? How do I make sure that my phone is not hacked? How, how do I make sure that I can safely travel to China and no one is going to come after me or detain me or take my laptop? Like, you have no guarantees. You can just do the best that you can. There's also an insane amount of technical debt. It's like this thing that we all have that costs money and time and people and resources to do something about. No one wants to do it, but it does present a security challenge as well. Security at scale is really, really, really hard. Um, I think that one of the examples I can, I can give is like, if your um, option is between asking 1,200 people to turn on two-factor for the email versus turning it on for them by default, turning it on by default is certainly the better option. Um, at that point, it's just enforced. It is at scale. You don't have to chase 1,200 people for the next 2,000 years. But doing that across this like gigantic attack surface is really hard, and there aren't any sort of perfect solutions. I'll also say that within this industry, like we're not necessarily incentivized to solve security. Because security products don't necessarily work well with each other. You'll have one that gives you A, you'll have another one that gives you B. Maybe they sort of kind of play well together, but they probably won't. There's like threat intelligence sharing, but only among people who are really good friends and other special people. Um, you get some of the information that you need, but not all of it. So companies are here to make money because security is a big problem, because there is this huge attack surface, but we're not really incentivized to actually solve the problem for real. On the economic side, everybody needs good security, but not everyone will invest in it. Um, your team, probably, unless you're in sales, does not make money. I can tell you that me advising reporters at the New York Times on how to be safe online, no one, no one was really paying for that. It's not like subscribers were sending in money specifically so that the newsroom could be secure, right? So in many ways, we are a cost center. We're not the team that makes the business a whole lot of money, which means that requests from product and marketing and legal will typically come first, and security concerns are sort of added to the list at some point in time unless it becomes critically important. And then it's someone in leadership that gets to decide, well, what is critically important? And having that debate again and again and again can be pretty exhausting. And then there's that question of like, what is, what is right for people? What is right for your staff, for your users, for your subscribers, for your readers, for the people around you? And what are you as a company legally required to do? Whether you're talking about subs uh, securing subscribers um, at a media org or even in the context of GDPR, that again is this pretty interesting debate. And I think a lot of people will have a lot of different opinions about, well, how far do you go and how much focus do you put on um, doing the best that you can versus doing the bare minimum. And then on the emotional side, everybody deserves good security, but corporate politics gets in the way, which I just mentioned. We operate with probabilities, not guarantees. I can tell you that there are tools out there that allow you to check your phone to see if you currently have Pegasus on it. But that is the Pegasus the way that it looked probably a year ago, not necessarily Pegasus the way that it looks today. I cannot guarantee that your device is not compromised. I can do the best that I can to help you check to see if that is the case. And that can sometimes be really, really frustrating because I like, I like helping people feel like they're actually safe in doing what they're doing. Um, I don't want security to be something that they have to worry about, but knowing that we are sort of in that state all the time um, can sometimes be pretty, pretty sad. And like, there's no end state, which I think can be both a plus and a minus. On one end, there's no end state, which means that we constantly learn and improve and we get to do better and we come up with new solutions and new 
mitigations. At the same time, it does mean that we have this like constant arm, arms race with uh, people who do offense um, and other attackers. Um, and again, there is no guarantee. So any, any sort of mission-focused work is also hard. There's a lot of people that deeply care about what they do. There's a lot of people that have sometimes very different opinions on what is right and what is, what is right and how far do you go to make sure that you implement that and, and what is good enough in that specific case. So here's, um, here's my uh, final slide from my talk yesterday, actually, um, just to sort of highlight the example of um, some of the challenges in this space. In, in, in looking at how media orgs get hacked, I sort of looked at the New York Times in 2018, Tribute had ransomware in 2018, Taglada, Shipstead, and Almedia had some issues in 2019 and 2021. And if you, if you look at how reporters are hacked, we're talking usually a compromise of a social media account or a compromise of a device, and then sometimes a zero day like Pegasus. But if you look at how media organizations get compromised, we're looking at phishing, phishing and or an outdated system, um, leaked passwords, most likely lack of two-factor authentication. Um, again, Shipstead leaked passwords, likely a lack of two-factor authentication. And then Amedia with ransomware last year, phishing and or outdated system. Like, we know how to address phishing. We know how to address outdated systems. We know how to protect against ransomware. Like, these are not unsolvable, really hard problems. We know how to address them, but then we get back to this challenge of like, well, what is the right thing? What are we legally required to do? Do we have time? Do we have money? Do we really have to do this right now? And so even if we know what needs to be done, there will be other people somewhere higher up in the corporate stack uh, that decide that just now is not the time to spend the people and the money and what have you to do these types of things, which can be really frustrating. So where am I going with this like a very uplifting uh, coming up to the end of my talk? Um, do something different. Uh, also known as how to avoid burnout. Um, over the years, I've, uh, I've decided to sort of try something new once a year just to challenge myself a bit. So about four and a half years ago, I decided to try pole dancing, which I absolutely love and I still do. I tried improv, which I absolutely hated, but I went, I bought this like, pack of like four classes and I went and it sort of feels like when you go to the dentist, you go because you said you would go, but you're not really enjoying it. Um, scuba diving is still on my list for this year. Did the gun hacking, got my motorcycle license a couple of weeks ago, which I will tell you in the US is absolutely terrifying. Uh, built far too many mechanical keyboards. Um, do a bunch of like FOIA work, reverse engineering, malware analysis, just to learn something different. Um, and then, at least this year, there's been a whole lot of spy stories and true crime and journalists and spy and all sorts of fun stuff. And so I will say that finding something else to do is, it is really, really important. And it can, it can certainly be related to your work, it doesn't have to be. So, in short, defensive work is both great and terrible, it is mission critical to have diversity, and we can definitely do better in that space. We have done very well over the years, I would say. We can definitely do better. Security is hard, and there are no guarantees to what we do. I found what I love through my work with Tor. It's okay if you haven't found your thing yet. I would say figure out what it is that you love doing, and go and try that out, see, see if you can find a way to make that work. And with that, I hope you have a great conference. Thank you for coming, and if you have questions, let me know. Thanks so much, Runa, for sharing your experience in InfoSec. I think a lot of us can relate to the journey that you you took and uh, wanting to have an impact is a common thread for a lot of people uh, in this community. And uh, I think uh, we've been there. So uh, I, I'm 
I'm guessing that uh, you you found a way uh, to uh, to keep the positives outweighing the negatives in the end, and uh, that's why you're still here with us today. And we're not getting paid either, which I assume you knew, but I wanted to make that clear <laughs> to everybody out here. Uh, if it wasn't clear, B-Sides is run by um, a non Profits. An amazing group of volunteers. Yeah. Thank, thank you so yes. much. Um, thank you. We, we do have time for uh, questions. I'm going to ask one question just to grease the wheels here. Uh, you said that uh, you, you went to your, your first gun show. I'm wondering uh, if they still let you in or, or are you on some <laughs> list now? Have you been to any since? I have not been to any since. I am, I am not a big fan. And Remington actually, uh, they went bankrupt. Uh, they got uh, parted out to some buyers in uh, 2020. Coincidence? Probably. <laughs> it wasn't me. Okay. The, uh, anybody have any questions for Runa? If not, I'll be around later. So if yeah. you want to uh, chat in private, we got one in the back. Come chat. Oh, okay. Coming down. Keep your hands up. I have one question that you uh, probably have been asked a couple of times. Uh, did you ever get Doom running on the rifle? <laughs> I did not try to get Doom running on the rifle. The software update screen, though, shows uh, Duck Hunt. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, spies and journalists. Um, is spying still as common now as it was back in, like, for example, the Cold War days? It's a good question. I think I would say yes, but it probably looks a bit different um, than it did back then. I think more of it is now online. Like, you don't need to place people um, in different mm -hmm. countries, in different bureaus, under different covers. A lot of it can just be done online. Yeah. Online and anonymous, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Brown. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Um, very briefly, when you're talking about your security work towards journalists, um, was it normally aimed at the digital side of things? So how to secure their devices, how to secure their accounts and that? Or when also some of your work and you're advising journalists traveling to <coughs> North Korea, Moscow, et cetera, you'd give them advice on how to secure their person as well. Um, how did you balance that? Sure. Um, so I've always just focused on the digital side of things. So before, let's see, back in 20, early 2016, I took a hostile environment uh, training course focusing on physical security training, just to have some sense of what it is that the reporters would go through. But um, I've always just then either worked closely with or like found someone who does physical security work so that I can just tag on to what they are doing and we can together find a solution that actually works for the reporters who are going out. Um, so that's what I still try to do. Like I can, I can figure out who to talk to, but I don't want to give much advice about what to do from a physical safety standpoint. Questions? <laughs> Similar question, but not quite. Okay. Um, since you're securing now, or giving advice on how to secure when people are traveling to other regions, do you use the same advice for when they actually are in the native country? And I'm thinking specifically if you're in the US and you have to worry about, say, the police are going to do an investigation on you, or the FBI, or if you're in the UK and things happening, or even you're in Norway. So access, requ access requests for information and investigations. Do you use the same advice, or do you change it? Because now you've got legal, local concerns. I do, I do change it. Like, if you're traveling to, say, Moscow, having a travel laptop and travel phone is, like, an easy advice to give. But if you're living there, or if you're going to be there for, like, four or five, six months, that's not going to be super helpful. It's not going to be sustainable, right? And so at that point, it's, it's more about figuring out how you secure the devices that you do have with you. So we can talk full disk encryption, power it off. We can talk about having a safe. Um, and then also to your point about um, different jurisdictions, yeah, there's a different discussion among people who cover protests in North Africa versus New York City versus in Oslo 
for example. It just really depends on where you are, what you're trying to achieve, and also how technical you are. Like, there's a bunch of like super neat technical tools that are out there to do stuff in a safe way, but not all of them are usable, not all of them are cheap, not all of them are like scalable. Um, so it, it really sort of comes down to like that specific context. I do think that today we have the tools and the technology for people to be safe online. So then it just comes down to like process and workflow and budgets and resources and all of that fun stuff. Any other questions? Last question. Um, where would you draw the line in securing end users that consume your product? For example, subscribers. You talked about MFA. Would you even go as far as to enforce strong password policies? And what are other, I guess, recommendations do you have to secure end users? So in, um, in the subscriber context specifically, and I know that this is something like the big tech in the US are doing already. So there's um, strong passwords required for some of them at least, there's two-factor authentication in some form is, if not required, then at least um, available. You have both Google and Facebook now have, um, Facebook calls it, I don't know, Facebook Graph? I forget the name. Google has the um, Advanced Protection Program, which enforces uh, YubiKey auth on your Google account and provides a stronger level of uh, security on, on your account. And so Facebook has the equivalent for people who want to opt in. Um, and in addition, these companies also do download and share public password dumps to see if your uh, password is, is in there and if it is, forces a password reset. And so I think that all of this is doable, just not a lot of companies actually do it because it goes beyond what they're legally required to do to protect their users. All right. Uh, are you going to be with us for? I'll be around until after around? lunch, at least. Fantastic. So if you want to chat with Rune, please uh, take the opportunity. And thank you so much for joining cool. us. Thank you.